The following reading of Robert Haldane's Commentary on Romans, commencing with chapter 1, verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold or suppress the truth in unrighteousness. The apostle begins here by proving that the Gentiles were all guilty and all subjected to the just judgment of God. The wrath of God is revealed. The declaration of the wrath of God is a fit preparation for the announcement of grace, not only because wrath necessarily precedes grace in the order of nature, but because to dispose men to resort to grace, they must be affected with the dread of wrath and a sense of their danger. The wrath of God denotes his vengeance by ascribing, as is usual in Scripture, the passions of men to God. It implies no emotion in God, but has reference to the judgment and feeling of the sinner who is punished. It is the universal voice of nature, and is also revealed in the consciences of men. It was revealed when the sentence of death was first pronounced. The earth cursed a man driven out of the earthly paradise, and afterwards by such examples of punishment as those of the deluge and the destruction of the cities of the plain by fire from heaven, but especially by the reign of death throughout the world. It was proclaimed in the curse of the law on every transgression, and was intimated in the institution of sacrifice, and on all the services of the Mosaic dispensation. In the eighth chapter of this epistle, the apostle calls the attention of believers to the fact that the whole creation has become subject to vanity and groans and travails together in pain. The same creation which declares that there is a God and publishes his glory also proves that he is the enemy of sin and the avenger of the crimes of men, so that this revelation of wrath is universal throughout the world and none can plead ignorance of it. But above all, the wrath of God was revealed from heaven when the Son of God came down to manifest to the divine character. And when that wrath was displayed in his sufferings and death, in a manner more awful than by all the tokens God had before given of his displeasure against sin. Besides this, the future and eternal punishment of the wicked is now declared in terms more solemn and explicit than formerly. Under the new dispensation, there are two revelations given from heaven, one of wrath, the other of grace, against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Here the apostle proceeds to describe the awful state of the Gentiles, living under the revelation of nature, but destitute of the knowledge of the grace of God revealed in the gospel. He begins with accusing the whole heathen world, first of ungodliness, and next of unrighteousness. He proves that, so far from rendering to their creator the love and obedience of a grateful heart, they trampled on his authority and strove to rob him of his glory. Failing then in their duty towards God, and having plunged into the depth of all ungodliness, it was no wonder that their dealings with their fellow men were characterized by all unrighteousness. The word all denotes two things. The one is that the wrath of God extends to the entire mass of ungodliness and unrighteousness, which reigns among men without accepting the least part. The other is that ungodliness and unrighteousness had arrived at their height and reigned among the Gentiles with such undisturbed supremacy that there remained no soundness among them. The first charge brought under the head of ungodliness is that of holding the truth and unrighteousness. The expression, the truth, when it stands unconnected in the New Testament, generally means the gospel. Here, however, it is evidently limited to the truth concerning God, which by the works of creation and the remains of the law of conscience, and partly from tradition, was notified to the heathens. 
The word hold in the original signifies to hold fast a thing supposed to be valuable, as well as to withhold, as it is rendered in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 6, and to restrain or suppress. The latter is the meaning here. The heathen did not hold fast the truth, but they suppressed or restrained what they knew about God. The expression signifies they retained it as in a prison, under the weight and oppression of their iniquities. But besides this general accusation, the apostle appears particularly to have had reference to the chief men among the pagans whom they called philosophers, and who professed themselves wise. The declaration that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, attacked directly the principle which they universally held to be true, namely that God could not be angry with any man. Almost all of them believed the truth of the divine unity which they communicated to those who were initiated into their mysteries. But all of them at the same time held it as a maxim and enjoined it as a precept on their disciples that nothing should be changed in the popular worship of their country to which without a single exception they conformed, although it consisted of the most absurd and wicked idolatrous rites, in honor of a multitude of gods of the most odious and abominable character. Thus they not only resisted and constantly acted in opposition to the force of the truth in their own minds, but also suppressed what they knew of it, and prevented it from being told to the people. Romans chapter 1, verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. It appears that, by the term wise, the apostle intended to point out the philosophers, that is to say, in general, those who were most esteemed for their knowledge, like those among the Greeks who were celebrated by the titles either of men, wise, or philosophers to the two evils remarked in the foregoing verse of their foolishness and their darkness, Paul here adds a third, that with all this they believe themselves to be wise. This is the greatest unhappiness of man, not only not to feel his malady, but to extract matter of pride from what ought to be a shame. What they esteemed their wisdom was truly their folly. All their knowledge for which they valued themselves was of no avail in promoting virtue or happiness. Their superstitions were in themselves absurd, and instead of worshipping God, they actually insulted Him in their professed religious observances. How wonderfully was all this exhibited in the sages of Greece and Rome, who rushed headlong into the boundless extravagances of skepticism, doubting or denying what was evident to common sense. Verse 24, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Therefore God also gave them up. The impurities into which the Gentiles were plunged sprung from their own corrupt hearts. We must therefore distinguish between their abandonment by God and the awful effects of that abandonment. The abandonment proceeded from divine justice, but the effect from the corruption of man in which God had no part. The abandonment is a negative act of God, or rather a negation of acting, of which God is absolutely master, since being under no obligation to confer grace on any man, he is free to withhold it, as he sees good, so that in this withholding there is no injustice. But besides this, it is a negation of acting which men have deserved by their previous sins, and consequently it proceeds from his justice, and is in this view to be considered as a punishment. Sin is indeed the consequence of this abandonment, but the only cause of it is human perversity. God's giving them up, then, does not signify any positive act, but denotes his not holding them in check by those restraints by means of which he usually maintains a certain degree of order and appearance of moral rectitude among sinners. 
God did not, however, totally withdraw those restraints by which his providence rules the world in the midst of its corruption. For if he had done so, it would have been impossible that society could have subsisted or the succession of generation continued. God, for these ends, still preserved among them some common rectitude and certain bonds of humanity. But in other respects, so far as concerned the impurities to which the apostle here refers, he released his restraints on the fury of their passions as a corresponding punishment for their idolatries. Thus was his justice manifested in giving up those who had dishonored him to dishonor themselves in a manner the most degrading and revolting. Verse 25 who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served a creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. By changing the truth of God, referring to the attributes essential to His being, is here meant the changing of the just and legitimate notions which ought to be formed of Him, not only in contemplation but chiefly in practice. The lie in the same way principally refers to practice not consisting only in speculative errors, but in perversity of action and superstitions and idolatries. The heathen changed the truth of God, that is, the true idea of God exhibited in the works of creation, into the false representations made of him in their superstitious idolatries, thus departing from the true God and receiving false gods in his stead. They worshipped the creature more, or rather, than the Creator, they pretended, indeed, that they did not forsake the Creator, while they served numerous divinities. They acknowledged that these were inferior to the Sovereign God, whom they called the Father of Gods and Men. But whenever religious worship is offered to the creature in any manner whatever, it is forsaking God, whose will it is not only that his creature should serve him, but that they should serve him alone, on which account he calls himself a jealous God. The idolatry of the pagans was, in reality, according to the view here given by the apostle, a total abandonment of the worship of God, who is blessed forever. Amen. Verse 26, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, verse 27, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lusts one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was fitting. The apostle having awfully depicted the magnitude of pagan wickedness, and having shown that their ungodliness and abandoning the worship of the true God was a reason why they had been abandoned to their lusts. Here descends into particulars for the purpose of showing to what horrible excesses God had permitted them to proceed. This is necessary to prove how odious in the sight of God is a crime of idolatry. Its recompense was this fearful abandonment. It was also necessary in order to give a just idea of human corruption is evinced in its monstrous enormities when allowed to take its course, and also in order to exhibit to believers a living proof of the depth of the evil from which God had delivered them, and finally to prove the falsity of the pagan religion since. So far from preventing such excesses, it even incited and conducted men to their commission. Receiving in themselves that recompense, as the impiety of the pagans respecting God reached even to madness, it was also just that God should permit their corruption to recoil upon themselves and proceed also to madness. It was just that they who had done what they could to cover the Godhead with reproaches should likewise cover themselves with infamy and so receive a proportionate and retributive recompense. Verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. 
The apostle shows here how justly the pagan idolaters were abandoned, since they had so far departed from the right knowledge of God. In the 18th verse, he had declared that the wrath of God was revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. He had now conclusively established the first charge of ungodliness against the Gentiles, adding to it their consequent abandonment to the vilest affections. He next proceeds to demonstrate their unrighteousness. And as they did not like. This is not quite literal, yet it seems the best phrase that can be used to convey the spirit of the original. The word in the Greek signifies to prove or approve. They did not approve of retaining God in their knowledge. But this cannot mean that their approbation respected their conscience, dark as it was. They did not approve, because as a common translation well expresses it, they did not like. This applies to them all. Neither the lawgivers nor the people like to hold in remembrance the God of holiness and justice. To retain God in their knowledge. The common translation has here substantially given the spirit of the original. The heathen are thus said to have known God, but knowing him they did not wish to retain that knowledge. This is a crime in the sight of God, which subjects men to the most awful judgments of his justice. For it is on this account that the apostle adds that God also gave them up to a reprobate mind. This pointedly refers to the word applied to them, as not approving the retaining of the knowledge of God. It indicates a mind judicially blinded, so as not to discern the difference between things distinguished even by the light of nature. Thus a dark eclipse of their understanding concerning divine things, which they had despised and rejected, had been followed by another general eclipse respecting things human, to which they had applied themselves. And in this consisted the proportion which God observed in their punishment. They did not act according to right reason and judgment towards God. This is their crime. They did not act according to it among themselves and society. This was the effect of the abandonment of God and became their punishment. This passage clearly shows that all that remains of moral uprightness among men is from God, who restrains and sets bounds to the force of their perversity. Not convenient. This is a very just and literal translation according to the meaning of the word convenient in an early stage of the history of our language, but it does not at present give the exact idea. The original word means what is suitable to the nature of man as a rational and moral being. To do things not convenient is a figurative expression denoting the doing of things directly contrary and opposite, namely to the light of reason the reflections of prudence and the dictates of conscience. Verse 29 Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers. Being filled This signifies that the vices here exposed were not tempered with virtues, but were alone and uncontrolled, occupying the mind and heart even to overflowing. Unrighteousness. When this word in the original is taken in a limited sense, it means injustice. It is often used for iniquity in general, as in the 18th verse. Some understand it here in the latter sense as a general word which includes all the different particulars that follow. There is no reason, however, why we should not understand it as one species of the evils which are here enumerated, and confine it to a specific meaning, namely, injustice. This was a public crime of the Romans who built their empire on usurpation and rapine. Fornication Cicero speaks of fornication as unblameable, as a thing universally allowed in practice, which he never heard was condemned, either in ancient or modern times. Here it includes all the violations of the seventh commandment. 
and is not to be confined to the distinctive idea which the term bears in our language. Wickedness. This refers to the general inclination to evil that reigned among the heathen and made them practice and take pleasure in vicious and unprofitable actions. Covetousness. The original word strictly signifies taking the advantage, overreaching in a bargain, having more than what is just in any transaction with our neighbor. Of this covetousness is a motive. This is universal among rich and poor, and was the spring of all their actions. Maliciousness means a disposition to injure and revenge. Full of envy. Tacitus remarks that this was the usual vice of the villages, towns, and cities. Murder was familiar to them, especially with respect to their slaves, whom they caused to be put to death for the slightest offenses. Debate. Strife about words for vainglory and not truth. Deceit was common to them all, and exemplified in their conduct and conversation, as is said in chapter 313. Malignity. Though the word in the original, when resolved into its component parts, literally signifies bad custom or disposition, yet it generally signifies something more specific, and is with sufficient propriety rendered malignity, which is a desire to hurt others, without any other reason than that of doing evil to them and finding pleasure in their sufferings. Verse 30. Backbiters. Haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Backbiters. The original word is here improperly translated backbiters. The word indeed includes such persons, but applies to evil speaking in general, to those in short who take a pleasure in scandalizing their neighbors without any reference to the presence or absence of those who are spoken against. And it by no means designates the giving of opprobrious language and bad names. Such persons are included in it, but not designated by it. Whisperers or tattlers are evil speakers without any peculiar distinction. Our translators have erred in rendering it backbiters. The word translated whisperers refers to a secret, and the word translated backbiters to an open slander. Secrecy is undoubtedly the characteristic of the first word, but the last is not distinguished from it by contrast, as implying publicity. On the contrary, the former class has included in the latter though here specifically marked. Verse 31, without understanding. Covenant breakers, without natural affection. Implacable, unmerciful, without understanding. This well expresses the original, for although the person so described were not destitute of understanding as to the things of this world, but as to these might be the most intelligent and enlightened, yet in a moral sense, or as it respects the things of God, they were unintelligent and stupid. This agrees with the usual signification of the word, and it perfectly coincides with the universal experience. All men are by nature undiscerning as to the things of God, and to this there never was an exception. Covenant Breakers This is a correct translation. If covenant is understood to apply to every agreement or bargain referring to the common business of life, as well as the solemn, all-important contract between nations and individuals. Without natural affection, there is no occasion to seek for some particular reference in this, which is evidently its verification in many different things. Some suppose that the apostle has the Stoics in his eye. Others suppose that it refers to the exposure of children. Others with more propriety extends the term to filial and parental love. But still the reference is broader. Still there are more varieties comprehended in the term. Why limit to one thing but applies to many? Even though one class should be peculiarly prominent in the reference, to confine it to this robs it of its force. 
implacable. The word in the original signifies as we persons who will not enter into league, as persons who, having entered into league, continually break it. In a former sense, it signifies implacable and designates those who are peculiarly savage. In a latter sense, it refers to those who violate the most sacred engagements, entered into with all the solemnities of oaths and religious rites. Unmerciful. There is no reason to confine this to those who are unmerciful to the poor. Such, no doubt, are included. But it extends to all who are without compassion. Persons need our compassion who are not in lack. They may be suffering in many ways. It applies to those who do not feel for the distresses of others, whatever may be the cause of their distresses, and to those who inflict these distresses it peculiarly applies. Verse 32. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do them, but have pleasure in them that do them. Knowing the judgment of God, or the sentence or ordinance of God. This the heathens knew from the work of the law written in their hearts. Although they had almost entirely stifled in themselves the dictates of conscience, it did not cease in some measure to remonstrate against the unworthiness of their conduct and to threaten the wrath of God which their sins deserved. They recognized it by some remains they had of right notions of the Godhead, and by which they still understood that God was judge of the world. And this was confirmed to them by examples of divine vengeance, which sometimes passed before their eyes. They knew it even by the false ideas of the superstition in which they were plunged, which required them to seek for expiations, that they knew it in a measure as evident by their laws, which awarded punishments to some of those vices of which they were guilty. Worthy of death. It is difficult to determine with certainty whether death is here to be understood literally or figuratively. Moses Stewart considers it as decided that it cannot mean literal death, because it cannot be supposed that the heathen judged everything condemned by the apostle to deserve capital punishment. He understands it in his figurative sense as referring to future punishment. But an equal difficulty meets him here. Did the heathen know that God had determined to punish the things thus specified with death, according to its figurative import, everlasting punishment? He does not take the word, then, in this sense, to its full amount, but is meaning punishment, misery, and suffering. But this is a sense which a word never bears. If it refer to future punishment, it must apply to that punishment in its full sense that the heathen judge many of the sins here enumerated worthy of death, is clear from their ordaining death as their punishment. And the apostle does not assert that they judge them all worthy of death, but they judge the doers of such things worthy of death. It seems quite enough, then, that those things for the commission of which they ordain death were such as he mentions. Archbishop Newcomb understands the word for they themselves. He said, punish some of their vices with death. Not only do they do the same, but they have pleasure in them that do them. This is added to mark the depth of their corruption. For when men are not entirely abandoned to sin, although they allow of it in their own circumstances and practice, yet they condemn it in their general notions and in the practice of others, because then it is not connected with their own interest and self-love. But when human corruption has arrived to its height, men not only commit sins, but approve of them and those who commit them. While this is strictly applicable to the whole body of the people, it was chargeable in the highest degree on the leaders and philosophers, who, having more light than the others, treated in their schools some of those things as crimes, of which they were not only guilty themselves, but the commission of which they encouraged by their connivance, especially in the abominable rites practiced in the worship of their gods. By these conclusive proofs, Paul substantiates his charge in verse 18 against the whole Gentile world first of ungodliness and then of unrighteousness as its consequence, 
against which the wrath of God is revealed. It should also be observed that, as in another place, Titus 2, verse 12, Paul divides Christian holiness into three parts, namely sobriety, righteousness, and godliness. In the same way, in this chapter, he classes pagan depravity under three heads. The first is their ungodliness, namely that they have not glorified God, that they have changed his glory into images made like to corruptible creatures, that they have changed his truth into a lie which is opposed to godliness. The second is intemperance. God had delivered them up to uncleanness and vile affections which are opposed to sobriety. The third is unrighteousness and all the other vices noted in the last verses which are opposed to righteousness. It is impossible to add anything to the view here given of the reign of corruption among the heathen, even the most celebrated and civilized, which is fully attested by their own historians. Nothing can be more horrible than this representation of their state, and as the picture is drawn by the Spirit of God, who is acquainted not only with the outward actions, but with the secret motives of men, no Christian can suppose that it is exaggerated. The apostle then had good reason to conclude in the sequel that justification by works is impossible, and that in no other way can it be obtained but by grace. For on the whole we see how terrible to his posterity have been the consequences of the sin of the first man. And on the other hand, how glorious in the plan of redemption is the grace of God by his Son. An exposition of Romans one eighteen to thirty two Robert Haldane.